This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects is the free app that lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download Bloomberg Connects to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to a brand new series of A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about their cultural experiences and influences, the artists that have inspired them, the writers and poets they read, the musicians they listen to and the cultural encounters that have proved to be epiphanies in their lives and work. And for this first episode of Series 4, it's a brush with Michael Rakowitz. Michael was born in 1973 in Great Neck on Long Island in New York to an American Jewish father and Iraqi Jewish mother. He now lives in Chicago. His biography is really significant because in Michael's art, the personal and the political are often intertwined. He interweaves his autobiography and his background with global geopolitics, Western imperialism and reflections on human rights abuses. He also looks at the history of cultural patrimony, the politics of heritage, but always people are at the centre of his work. So, for instance, in his ongoing project Return, he recreated his Iraqi Jewish grandfather's import-export business. And in another ongoing project Enemy Kitchen, he cooks his mother's Baghdadi recipes for different groups, often school groups, for instance. Both of those projects were started in the aftermath of the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003 and attempted to create more nuanced discussions around their subject than were being covered in other forms of media. In doing so, he hoped to illuminate the histories of the Middle East, the present-day lives of those amid the conflict and the refugees fleeing it, and the legacies of Western colonialism, among much else. One of Michael's most important projects, The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, also focuses on the legacy of that war, and particularly the 7,000 artefacts that were stolen from the National Museum of Iraq in Baghdad after the US invasion. Michael's undertaken, remarkably, to recreate every single one of those looted archaeological objects, using the packaging of Middle Eastern foodstuffs found in the US and local newspapers read by the US's Arabic communities. And he's shown those objects in various exhibitions in recent years. The idea was to illustrate that works of art and heritage monuments always relate to the people who make and conserve them, and as Michael said, when heritage is destroyed and lost, so too are those communities. The project extended beyond the looted museum works into those destroyed by Islamic State, and the most prominent example was the Lamassu, the winged bull with a human head which stood for two years on the 4th plinth in Trafalgar Square in London, and its surface was entirely covered in the packaging from cans of date syrup. A recreation of the ancient Lamassu of Nineveh that was destroyed by ISIS in 2015, it was, to my mind, one of the best of all the sculptures to have occupied the plinth since 2000. It illustrated Michael's remarkable ability to tell complex stories in profound and powerful ways, and he does that using a very broad range of media, from sculptures to radio broadcasts to cookbooks and comics and public events. He also has a brilliant knack of referencing multiple cultural forms, so in one work he linked the film Star Wars with Iraqi militarism, and in another he linked the breakup of the Beatles with a history of pan-Arabism. That commitment to engaging with a broad public and using popular culture is crucial to his entire body of work. Michael studied with Christoph Wodichko, who in the 1980s was a pioneer of socially engaged and activist public art. And throughout, Michael was built on that tradition, from his earliest architectural interventions to his most recent work, which is a public sculpture in Margate in the UK, which was unveiled in April 2021. It's called April is the Cruelest Month, quoting a line from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, and it depicts a British veteran of the Iraq War, Daniel Taylor, whose war medal is actually embedded in the sculpture. Beneath the concrete statue is a plaque on which lines from the poet Siegfried Sassoon are quoted. From a distance, the work could appear to be a conventional sculpture, so I began our conversation by asking Michael if he intended it to be a kind of investigation of what statuary means today. Absolutely. And there's a site specific response to it because there's already this statue that is a monument 
It's called the Surf Boat Memorial, and it's dedicated to the oarsmen who set up these kinds of lifeboat rescues and off the coast of Margate. It actually commemorates the capsizing in 1897 of the rescue boat called Friend to All Nations, in which I believe nine rescuers had perished. And the ship that they were going to rescue was called the Persian Empire. And uh, so I immediately started to think about the coast of Margate and the coast of my mother's homeland and thinking about the city of Basra, because I was on this Cornish in Margate. And there were these statues on the Cornish in Basra that were actually thrown from their pedestals after the British occupied uh, in the wake of the U.S.-led invasion. And so I thought about what appears on a pedestal and what are the conditions that allow for something to stand on it and then what are the conditions that necessitate the removal. And so it it is conventional in the sense that it's statuary that is m- mimicking the ones that were in Basra, which in and of itself were not exotic when we think about other war memorials that are in the world. So the one in Basra was comprised of 80 soldiers looking across the Shat al-Arab towards Iran, (laughs) the Persian Empire, and uh, pointing in the direction in which they were felt. And the people wanted them removed in 2003, 2004, because the majority Shia population did not want their kids growing up uh, learning to hate Iranians. And so I thought that these purged war memorials necessitated a kind of reconditioning underneath the water where all these other new forms of life were growing off of them to have it reemerge on the Cornish and Margate as an anti-war memorial. So when you're looking at this statue that is actually, you could argue it's the 81st statue in that series of 80, it is a British soldier who was stationed in Basra when those statues were coming down. But instead of pointing to, across the water towards some imagined enemy, it's actually pointing inland towards Parliament, where the decision to go to war was made and where he, in some sense, fell. So we're talking about a soldier who came back, Daniel Taylor, and became somebody who was fighting for peace. And so it's a sculpture that has changed its position for a soldier that changed his. One of the things that you consistently talked about in relation to your public works is this idea of hauntings, of of ghosts of other works, of ghosts of destroyed heritage. Can you say something about that haunting, those spectral presences that, that your your works convey? Yes, well, I think that there are points in which people don't want to be reminded of certain things. And the Lamassu in Trafalgar Square could have very easily just been one more Lamassu in the city of London. Um, But the material culture of that work was consistent with all of these other artifacts that were looted from sites like the National Museum of Iraq, like the Mosul Museum, and were destroyed in places like Nineveh or Nimrud. And when we look at the context of those things, we have a relationship with those works because so many of our imperial and encyclopedic museums are populated with them. And we can't look at the destruction of those sites in a vacuum. They did not begin and end with ISIS in 2015. In fact, it began in the middle of the 19th century when you have people like Austin Henry Laird excavating those sites but on top of the excavation there's the extraction where you have 400 of the 600 reliefs in the northwest palace of Nimrud the Assyrian reliefs that are then sent to places like the British Museum the Louvre the Oriental Institute in Chicago and Iraq has been forced to look at their history through these gaps in these absences and so there's a part of that whole kind of picture that you need to see that they were destroyed in a way 
because we valued them so much. But that value that we assign to the objects is never quite symmetrically assigned to the people. And so I think that that's one of the things that I try to do in those hauntings is making these things that have reappeared, you know, as these ghosts. And they're made from the detritus of the objects in diaspora that allow for people from those places who themselves are displaced through this kind of constant warfare. And um, and it's a, an indication of survival, of the fact that these these sculptures that are made in life size are made from the materials that allow for us to reappear in life size the meals that we would have made if we were still in mesopotamia or the kind of family gatherings that we would have made um so so that's one of the things that that i i hope to do that i try to do is that in a way the material culture of this kind of urgent material of these fragments of cultural visibility that are enlisted to make these things that are invisible is meant to kind of create this ghost. And and in the case of Daniel's statue in Margate, I think that there's there's something a little bit different going on um, because it, it, it didn't want a one-to-one -one kind of ratio of materiality when it came to what I've done before. And um, thinking about Margate and thinking about the geological kind of just wonder of that place and the way in which sediment uh, creates these concretions around objects that become fossils and you end up with these these stones. I have some of them here, these like pieces of chalk that hold on to other things that it sort of forms around. What what ends up being one of the haunting elements in that work is that we made a new kind of stone. We made a new kind of stone from the calcite of Margate, from the, the sand and the dirt of Basra. And that was the aggregate around which the stone formed amidst these objects that were given by members of Veterans for Peace. Objects that were either war trophies or, you know, and following with uh, the story of Siegfried Sassoon, we're kind of continuing that tradition of, of giving one's medals back as a protest and so you know seeing those things up close as things that soldiers have gotten rid of you know it, it starts to kind of like take what we know from a war memorial um about it being this kind of glorification of heroism and you start to understand that it's almost like this form of child sacrifice that countries engage in when you know, everyone is sort of left to their own devices to only focus on on war as a means of conflict resolution. So that's one of the things that I think is there that is one of like the haunting elements to it. I wanted to ask you about your use of your own autobiography in the work and about how early on in your art making you came to the conclusion that sometimes the way to tell a story is to very directly involve it but then for instance when you were just talking about april is the coolest month you mentioned the fact that there is this you know a hint of your own autobiography in the in this idea of persia sure. this idea of what your mother's homeland so can you say something about that conviction to inject mm. your own story into into the work and, ha and how you sort of employ that in different ways well i think as an artist i'm interested in what the stakes are for me in making work. I think that I've approached many different contexts and manners that, you know, diversify the means of articulation when it comes to the aesthetics or the material. But I think for me, you know, one of the the elements that that I end up delighting in is like realizing that those connections happen. And one of the things that I really am interested in in the sighting of the work in Margate is that it's next to that surfboat memorial. So you have these two figures that are both life-size, they're not larger than life, in conversation with one another. One is pointing out towards sea or looking out towards sea, and the other one is looking inland with its back to the sea. But then the next sight that is on 
that piece of coast is the Nalen Rock uh, Shelter. And this is the site where T.S. Eliot was convalescing. You know, he was convalescing in Margate. And so it's the site at which he started to begin to write The Wasteland. And in that poem, he writes, On Margate Sands, I can connect nothing to nothing. And I felt like I could connect everything to everything. You know, and, and if I think about that surf boat figure looking out towards sea in 1897, I know that that same kind of looking out towards sea is not about rescuing people, but about turning them away. And so that for me became one of the things to really focus on when it comes to positionality. And so I recognize that the coast is a place where you have an intersection of hospitality and hostility, which come from the same root word. And it's a rough edge. And if I was thinking about the coast in relationship to France, for instance, you know, what comes to mind is that these were geologically connected at a certain point. And if you look at the edge of both countries, it looks like they've been torn from each other. But I also think about Calais, for instance, you know, and, and it, it, it actually is not such a stretch to connect what's going on in Calais and the refusal of people seeking refuge to something like the Iraq war. Like if we think about that situation, we have to recognize the fact that people are fleeing their homes because of everything that was destabilized in the wake of of this atrocious military adventure and um and so for me it's not necessary that i introduce my autobiography into it but it becomes something where i recognize that i have something that's at stake in this work, that the uprooting of artifacts and the kind of colonial carving up, you know, of the sites and of the territories led to the conditions that made it unsafe for my own family to live there. And so I see myself as a kind of, you know, something that's been dispersed um, and displaced. And when I think about the gesture of giving back medals, you know, realizing that Siegfried Sassoon was actually a direct relation, though I come from that same family, was one of those moments of connection where, you know, there's this constant engagement that I've been having with, uh, with veterans here in the U.S. And when they threw their medals back at the NATO conference in 2012, they cited Siegfried Sassoon as being the inspiration and to recognize that there's another way of understanding my own engagement as a vector that goes uninterrupted from something that happens in the past, it, it becomes a layer that I, I, I think makes the work, you know, more interesting. Let's turn to the questions that we ask all our guests now. So uh, who was the first artist whose work you loved? Well, this is going to be a really boring answer, you know, because I think that the deep dive that I took into Michelangelo's um, history was something that really kind of made me aware that um, this was somebody who I wanted to know more and more and more about. And, you know, it really kind of came into a different level of admiration after uh, being taught how to stone carve, you know. So before that, my dad's parents, um, I remember, had, uh, you know, little figurines of the David, you know, and and my grandmother on my dad's side was an artist. Uh, she was a calligrapher by trade. And, you know, she would explain and narrate a little bit to me what our relationship was to David, you know, as Jews, but but also talking about just the the story of how it was carved, which I knew about in more detail once I read like Vasari and also, you know, even books like The Agony and the Ecstasy. 
um, which are based on Vasari's writing. My introduction to his statuary was also through, you know, looking at the um, the statue of Moses. There's a belief that it was damaged, you know, that there were these rays of light that were coming from his forehead. But when it apparently broke, they ended up looking like horns. And so this is one of the reasons why you have that anti-Semitic stereotype about Jews having horns. And um, and so, you know, I realized that that art becomes really important, you know, <laughs> in terms of like uh, people's beliefs and, and the ability for it to influence people's uh, opinions. And then like as I got older and started to read up on him when I did, made a decision to go to art school, there's just amazing, amazing things in his biography that that I could almost psychoanalyze myself with. That like one of his first commissions was to make an exact replica of a piece of Greek statuary, and the person that he made it for buries it, and then more or less fakes that it's been excavated <laughs> and sells it as a relic, you know, to an antiquities collector in Florence, and Michelangelo becomes like furious that he's somehow implicated in this sleazy crime you know and the person who commissioned him was just like you know um, more or less sticks his tongue out and says look you did it you know you're just a gun for hire <laughs> there's so many different anecdotal stories around that period of time that involves not just michelangelo but the other names that you hear all the time the de medicis it opens up wider perspectives on the disease of patronage and and everything else but you know it's a long answer to the question but um <laughs> but i really really i think my love for stone carving comes through you know feeling like i'm communing with those ancestors you know that's lovely which historical artist do you turn to the most now well i always feel somehow refreshed you know when i when I go back to the work of Gordon Mata Clark, you know, there's something about his practice and his search for his practice and his constant experimentation. And again, just the wide range that he enlisted in his practice that that I always find really exciting. Um, I feel the same about Eva Hess and her work and also her relationship with Solowit and I went to school with some of Solowitz's um, uh, assistants. And so the kind of community that he created around him was something that also interested me. I don't think anyone would ever really refer to Solowit as a socially engaged artist, but I see him in that frame, especially with the way that those instruction paintings really are a form of communication and transmission from one hand to another. And he wrote this really gorgeous letter to Eva Hess when she was going through a divorce and then also suffering from, you know, artist block, I guess. And that letter is something I distribute to my students all the time because it shows the care from one artist to another and, um, and just the fearlessness that he's sort of like telling her to get back to. You know, so I, I tend to go back to that historical period, I think, of like, you know, the 60s and the 70s in New York. I'm so pleased you mentioned Matter Clark because one of the things about him is that, that, yes, you're right in describing him as a historical artist, that unfortunately he died very many years ago yeah. now, you know. but At a very um, young age. And at a very young age. And same with Ava Hesse. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, two, two artists lost, you know, absolutely in their prime making extraordinary work. And, you know, what they would have been seen to have had long careers in front of them and they remain hugely influential figures but one of the things about them is that they seem constantly renewed and and one of the ways in which for instance Matter Clark has just been renewed is that David Hammond's just done this yes um, homage to him on the on the waterfront of the Hudson yeah in New York and it one of the things about that is that you know like you clearly Hammond's has feels this connection with matter clock he's an artist artist to a degree exactly yeah and i think that that work is so wonderful you know and i i've read the way in which you know adam weinberg has talked about the work in relationship to everything that's contained in it 
you know, that when you look at it, it has the water in it at one angle. You look at it, it has the landscape in, in it. You look at it, it has New Jersey in it in one position, you know. So, you know, if someone like Hammonds is also a big part of that place that I go to, I think, when I'm when I'm sometimes feeling, you know, when it feels rough or when it feels like, um, you know, I have a lot of questions about the ecosystem that we're all working in right now. And so I think that being in a historical moment like they may have been in, you know, in New York and in L.A., during those times, you know, there's a big part of Hammond's legacy that is all about him creating spaces that can support other artists and support other artworks. And it's that degree of commitment and curiosity, you know, that I that I seek out, you know, and I, and I know where I get it from. I wish it was more the rule than the exception. And so I, I think that that entire scene and Joan Jonas, who I studied with, uh, was also very much a part of that. And I felt very grateful for, you know, just how candid she was about those relationships and about like the different loft, you know, exhibitions and viewing parties and performances that were part of that ecosystem. And you realize that it's the bankruptcy of a city like New York that creates those conditions where people can do what they're doing. And it more or less like you realize that New York is not going to be that again. Absolutely. I, I love that thing that you said that, that Joan Jonas told you that, well, you said that she gave you permission to storytell. Mm -hmm. And I love this idea that Joan Jonas actually said to, you, said to you, effectively gave you permission to tell the stories that have become such a crucial element of your work. Of course. Yeah. And I don't think it would have come from a male professor. You know, I do think that, again, coming back to what we were talking about before with autobiography, you know, somehow being in there, that I was taught by a, a minimalist uh, sculptor in in undergrad. And the idea of, of having content in the work was something that was seen as a crutch. And you, you don't question it at that point. You think to yourself, well, this is where we, this is what the avant-garde has said we need to do, right? You know, but then, then you realize, holy shit, that, that's incredibly violent, you know, to get rid of all that stuff. There's room for all of it. There's room for minimalism, you know, but the one thing that I hated and I continue to hate in, in you know, the, the kind of more theoretical and critical spheres that that happen around art is you know this this declaration you know that things need to be a certain way you know in order, order for them to be effective and and i think that joan allowed for all of us that studied with her to just really kind of to have permission to story tell but to also do weird things to fail you know like i didn't read beckett before i met Joan Jonas, you know, and so there was there was a lot that was offered. And I think that, you know, this is one of the reasons why it's increasingly more important, you know, to to really understand who's not being seen, you know, in in our cultural spaces, you know, and and to not just turn it into this like diversity, equity, inclusion you know, form of representation, but to also really kind of stay with the trouble, you know, to use Donna Haraway's terms, um, when it comes to what, what hasn't been part of the historical vector that has been uh, affecting, you know, young artists. Um, it's one of the things that I think about in my own kind of like, um, you know, the, the next steps, you know, I think for me are about you know, not teaching at the college level, but starting to teach, you know, early childhood education and also, you know, high school art, because I know that those are the places where, you know, when somebody asks you that question that you just asked me, who was the first artist you came across, you know, and you say to yourself, okay, it's Michelangelo, you know, but wouldn't it be great if somebody said, oh, for me, it was Amal Kanawi. You know, and that has a lot to do with people just, I think, broadening their scopes. Do you have 
arse around you in the studio? Do you have things pinned to the studio wall? I have uh, some works that I, I have a lot of, of things that are art ephemera. I have, uh, you know, this one piece by Ryan Gander that was like from one of the exhibitions that he did in Montreal that says make every work of art like it's your last. Seems like a nice thing to have up on the wall. I have the piece that um, Rene Gabri and Irina Nastas um, did in the Sharjah Biennial in 2007 that was um, a project where they had uh, gone around and spent time with the different workers and uh, they ended up recording them singing. I find that work to be incredibly inspiring, so that's up on my wall. Um, a lot of work by my kids, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the signs that they've made when I've come back from long trips, you know, to welcome <laughs> me home. I have a bottle of wine that I um, was given by Emily Jasser in uh, Bethlehem um, that's called The Grapes of Wrath. And uh, the story of that that wine is that the um, the grapes come from a vine uh, that was paved over by the Israeli occupation forces. And the vine eventually breaks through the concrete and starts to grow its grapes again. So it's made with um, it's made with those grapes. Yeah. And then there's a, a chalkboard that I have um, that's up in the space that's actually the remnant of a conversation that I had with the curator, uh, Stephanie Smith. Um, who was planning an exhibition with me that actually never happened. And we mapped out everything, you know, it like connected projects to projects. And, and, you know, it was almost like a psychoanalysis of why certain projects were really pivotal, you know, so for instance, Parasite, the shelters that I make every win winter, was a, a project that what Joan said was crucial that I had permission to storytell, you know, so that little bit of information is, is written up there. Parasite was this epiphany that came to you. It was, it, it, you know, you had been working in that territory, you'd studied with Christoph Roditschko, so you were conscious of this idea, this kind of, a kind of social activism through art. Yes. And then, but it, but it was, it was a kind of a, an epiphany on the street, right? You literally saw a homeless person who was sheltering beneath an air vent, which was keeping him warm. Mm. And, it was a person that was made invisible by society, you know, that you could see a moment of urgency like that and not see it. And the warm air that was leaving the building that was keeping this person warm for the night was also invisible. And immediately in my mind, I did this constellation of how the materiality could work, you know, of using rubbish bags and weatherproof proof plastic tape to capture that wind that was coming from a building's service system and create the conditions where this unhoused person could exist inside something that gained its structural sustenance from the air that was leaving the building, but also the thermal conditions that would keep somebody from freezing to death. And so it was a work that came out of my just having returned from Jordan, where I was studying the tents and the equipment of the Bedouin, and that and learning that those tents were set up differently every night depending on the wind patterns that move through the desert and that this was another kind of a wind and this was another kind of nomadism, not one that was by tradition uh, when it comes to the nomads of the desert, but somebody who was an urban nomad or a refugee. And being in Jordan and understanding Jordan also as a refugee country, and realizing that I was being led to look at these Bedouin sites, but being forbidden to visit the Palestinian refugee camps, that immediately set up for me the ways in which we have these same conditions in urban America. And it's not such an invisible line that connects the situation 
on the street here with what's happening in Palestine or in any other place where people have been displaced. So Kristoff was amazing to work with as a mentor. And, you know, I have to be very blunt and say that I that April is the cruelest month is very much about studying with him and also learning from him about monuments and that monuments are mostly invisible, that monuments cease to speak to their public after a while. And you have that famous Robert Musel quote that there is nothing more invisible than a monument, but Kshustov has always made them visible, you know, and he's done them in these ways that are critical and makes the monuments tremble in some way. And so it really was important for me to be able to work with him because his interrogation of form was also interrogation of language. And after the monument went up in Margate, you know, which I also call an anti-war memorial, you realize that monument comes from the word monere in Latin, which means to warn. And you have words like demonstrate, that come from that word and remonstrate to show somebody the error of their ways. But the word monster also comes from it. And the monsters were believed to have been sent down from the heavens to warn humanity. And so when I think about my own kind of relationship to monuments, you know, I don't want them to not be antagonistic. I want them to be critical, though. And so those interventions that Kristoff made it was crucial for me to see them in the mid-1990s because I had just witnessed all the toppling of the Eastern European monuments, you know, five or six years before. And here was this person that came from that very place who was finding another way, critically re-examining them. So, you know, his work in making the first homeless vehicle in the 1980s, 10 years before I did Parasite, again, I'm not doing any of that work without without the relationship and the kind of spark you know that he kind of created in in his teaching of me and and everybody who he's encountered he's the best teacher i've ever had This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. The app offers access to numerous cultural institutions through a single download. If you've listened to previous episodes of this podcast, you'll know that the app has guides to, among other museums, the Guggenheim, the Frick and Camden Arts Centre, and new partners are being added all the time. As you've heard, public art is at the heart of Michael Rakowitz's practice, and among his best-known works was his extraordinary Le Masu in London's Trafalgar Square. A couple of miles east of the square is the City of London, where, over the course of the last decade, more than 100 public artworks have been shown as part of Sculpture in the City, an annual exhibition effectively turning the district known as the Square Mile into an urban sculpture park. In the Bloomberg Connects Guide to Sculpture in the City, you can explore all the editions of the event to date, see images of the work in situ, often in striking architectural settings, and watch videos relating to the works. For more content and to explore guides to all the partnering institutions, download Bloomberg Connects today. You can find the app at bloombergconnects.org. It's also available to download from the App Store and Google Play. I suspect we may talk about critical reappraisals when we come to our next subject, which is sure. museums. But let's begin by asking, which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? Oh, well, recently it's been the student gallery at Northwestern, where we have the undergraduate show that just opened. And it's some of the strongest work I've seen from our our undergraduate art program. And we have this wonderful exhibition at the Block Museum of two graduate students who are Catherine Simone Reynolds and Shabtai Pinchevsky. Um, so I've been going to that space quite a lot. And it's because of my commitments as a teacher at Northwestern, but also like this one exhibition at the Block Museum of these two students is 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 a a really really important exhibition it's um catherine is a black woman artist from st louis you know having come from the midwest you know there's a a real kind of a critical urbanism that's in her work and shabtai is from israel and has been working in this very critical way of understanding the cartography 
of Israel as a kind of as a vector of settler colonialism and continued displacement. So I've been seeing that show a lot. And then I routinely go to the Oriental Institute. You know, it's relatively recent that these places have reopened. But uh, I know you and I have talked about the Oriental Institute a bit in our past conversations, but they're an important research institute that has spoken unflinchingly about issues around restitution, but also about their commitments to the local Assyrian population, which is quite robust here in Chicago. And so when you're in that space at, for instance, the Assyrian Aid Society's annual dinners, you know, you're looking at the descendants of the, the people that, that populated those cities like Nimrud and Nineveh, uh, who can no longer be home, who are there with these objects that are more than just objects, that they actually are relics that are imbued with a certain kind of spirit or energy that allows for them to to have portals, you know, back home, you know, so that that that's a space that I really love wrestling with. Wrestling with is is a really good way of putting it, because I imagine that on any given museum visit, of course, you're going to appreciate the work you're seeing. Mm -hmm. But all the time, museums are never neutral for you. Mm -hmm. you? I mean, and and they aren't to me either. Right. But but it's a source of debate, isn't it? Whether museums are neutral spaces. Absolutely. And, you know, for me, I think that that's an interesting place to make work from. It's the place that I hope I'm making my work from. I've told this story a lot, you know, but after my mom's mother, my grandmother, Renee, uh, passed away, we in our nuclear family lost, you know, the, the last person who could really remember Iraq. You know, we lived with my grandmother and my grandfather. And so when they passed away, you know, my mother, who was born in Bombay and then um, emigrated to the U.S. in in 47 when she was just two years old, there was a sense of loss. I mean, I'm 10 years old and I realize I've lost my grandmother and it was devastating. And I wasn't so conscious of the fact that we lost that last living link to Baghdad. But one of the things that happened, you know, we had this trip that was planned for London to visit my uncle Niazi and my auntie Tifa. And my uncle Niazi was my grandmother's brother. And there was something that felt like the healthiness of a wake or something, you know, where we were with somebody that sounded like my grandmother in terms of the accent uh, with which he spoke English and, you know, could tell stories about her. And there was something that was really, you know, healing about that trip. My mother and my father took me and my brothers to the British Museum. And my mother immediately did a beeline once we got through, you know, the ticket teller. And we ended up in the Assyrian galleries. And so she was showing us the lion hunt of Ashurbanipal. And she explains that this is the first comic book in human history and you know sequential art you can see the king on the chariot then he's shooting arrows and then lion has arrows in it and you you know when you're 10 years old there really isn't anything better than learning that your family comes from the place that made the first comic book but then my mother said and what is it doing here in london and it was in that moment that my mother started to explain that these that these places are com- complicated, you know, that they really are bitter, bittersweet, you know, that that you can sort of see that these objects end up elsewhere the same way that your family ends up elsewhere. Are they connected in some way? You know, we have to argue that, yes. And um, and so. I really recognized very early on just how these cultural sites and museums are almost monuments to extractivism and displacement. One museum, which, of course, you've never visited, but you must feel like you have been to, is that museum in Iraq from which 7,000 objects have been looted and 
un- we're unlikely to see them again, right. which you are now in the process of reconstructing. Yes. Tell me about that experience. Do you do, what? What is it? What's your relationship with that space like? You, I know that you're in the process of reconstructing these objects, but tell me about that about your conception, if you like, of that museum. It really is hard to conceive that relationship. Everything that I've looked at is is through photographs. Um, it's hard for me to even know what it would be like moving around in that space. I feel as though my intimacy with that space grew out of the relationships and the friendships with people like Dr. Dani Georgiou Khanna, who was the former director of the museum. He was the director at the time that it was looted. And then Salma Al-Radi, who worked at the museum as well as a researcher and curator and as an archaeologist. And I met both Dani and Salma in New York. And so I felt connected through them. And they and it had a lot to do with them coming to my exhibition and reacting to it in a way that I will never forget, you know, of having a meaningful reaction. Donnie said, you know, you've made these things out of materials these things would never be made out of, and the colors are all, like, wild. They never would have been colored, you know, that way in antiquity. But he said, you got the size right. And so when I'm standing next to them, it feels like I have this familiar body that's next to me. And... He said to me that that was the power of the work because he didn't expect that he was ever getting close to these objects again. And it ends up being doubly sad because he passed away in 2011 and was unable to return. And so I feel like I've I've gained proximity to that museum through Donnie, you know, through through him, through through Salma. And I think that that's powerful. Yeah. You know, uh, in, in some ways, you know, people have always sort of said, you've never been to Iraq, you know, you're making all of this work. And I don't know if I ever really need to go. You know, I think that there's something to that about being able to kind of be your archive. You know, you don't need an archive. You are the archive. I have all this information in me. You know, I know how to make the food my grandmother made. I know what to look for. You know, when I want to go and listen to Iraqi Jewish music, you know, there, there's all of these things that I need to kind of hold within myself as defiance, but also as preservation, you know, because I can't rely on being allowed to return somewhere because at a certain point I won't be allowed to stay. You know, this is something that I've learned and I've also observed it in the world. You know, so that th- this to me is is one of the things that that I would love to visit that museum one day. But I think that there is something that is almost like a material that has emerged from the distance of not being there. And it's a meaningful material because we're talking about works that are no longer there. Let's talk about literature. We've already begun to hint at literature. Yeah. But which writers or poets do you return to? Well, I have a really dear friend named M. Carmen Lane, who is a two-spirit Black and Haudenosaunee um, artist in Cleveland, Ohio, who's <laughs> quickly become one of my favorite artists in the world. And they um, they write poetry, uh, and I've been constantly returning to their work and reading it. I also read a lot of Iraqi poets like Dunya Mikhail, um, Sargon Bulos, who was an Assyrian Iraqi poet uh, who passed away, I believe, in 2007. And I, I'm constantly returning to the writings of somebody who I consider family and also a really important mentor, Ella Shahat. I just finished doing a work that was very much based on her essay called The Invention of Judeo-Arabic, uh, 
which centers around, you know, these prayer books that have always been mysterious to me, these prayer books that I'm holding up for you right now on camera that come from the Jewish community of Baghdad. Um, and I've been collecting them. My grandfather also had them um, when he left Iraq. You had one rebound as part of a project. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And Turin, the, you know, some of these uh, these books that I get are in really bad condition. And in the Jewish religion, there's a repository called the Reniza that's usually part of a synagogue where you bring these damaged Torah scrolls and prayer books. And because they have the name of God written, you're supposed to bury it. You know, but I've always looked to find ways of restoring it. And um, and so in Turin, where there's uh, the Ceruti Foundation, that's part of the Castello of the Rivoli, he introduced perfect binding to Italy. Um, and so his fortune came from making the telephone books in Italy. And his best friend was this guy named Luciano Fagnola, who was basically this imperfect binder. He did all this work by hand. And so I had Luciano um, actually fix this uh, prayer book. But what's interesting about these prayer books is that there's this purported thing called Judeo-Arabic, which follows in this idea that there must have been something like Yiddish for the Jews and Arab countries. But in fact, it's a lot more interesting than that, you know, and, it's, and it isn't quite that. And this shows like the fact that it wasn't partitioned from Arabic, that in fact... A lot of these prayer books are actually Arabic, but in Hebrew letters. And it actually points to the fact that the um, the synagogue in, in a lot of ways was the kind of space of education for people, you know, that not everybody had access to schools, you know. And so in order to read Arabic, they would read it, but transliterated, basically, through Hebrew letters. And, and I love this. You know, you see the word Allah written in Hebrew letters, and, and it becomes this, this very clear artifact of, of a sense of belonging. You know, that even in the midst of everything that we talk about with, yes, Jews were second-class citizens in many of these societies, there was still a sense of belonging. You know, and those are the things that I'm interested in unpacking, you know, even in the midst of the pain, you know, of being dispossessed. There are these moments where you realize that the term Arab and Jew are entwined, you know, very much so in my family and Ella's family. You know, I look at these things not as a nostalgia, you know, not as just an artifact, but as something that's been interrupted, you know, and could it ever be again? You know, so Ella's work has been really important for me in that sense. So I've, I've been reading a lot of her essays recently, stuff that I've read before, but going back to it, you know, in the midst of the horror and the atrocity that was visited upon Gaza and the Palestinian people in the last month, her essays were kind of like what got me through it, because you realize that there are other things that people are not talking about that this isn't some kind of like millennia old blood feud, you know, that there's a lot of bullshit behind that theory. And there's a lot to bring to light that shows ways in which in which people can move forward. I wanted to ask you about music because music's played a central role. Let's, let's begin by asking what music you, you listen to or other audio indeed when you're working. I've actually been listening to a lot of Armenian duduk music recently. I love the sound of the duduk, uh, and I started listening to it as, once again, the Armenian people have been facing just these atrocities from the Azerbaijani government. But I've always loved the sound of the duduk. I listen a lot to uh, Dawood and Salah Kuwaiti, who were these two Iraqi Jewish musicians that, uh, you know, similar to what I was talking about with Ella and her essays, the involvement of Iraqi Jewish musicians in the modern Iraqi music scene at the turn of the century had a lot to do with the fact that there was just a large number of Iraqi Jewish musicians. Some of it was because there was a Jewish school for, for the blind, 
Uh, and so those students would end up learning kanun and oud and all these other instruments as a way of, of, of heightening other senses. And, um, and so I've been listening to that a lot, um, Iraqi Jewish music a lot. And then I'm part of a record club that actually meets every Thursday night that my friend Steve Hutton organized. Uh, it used to be in person, but then when we went into lockdown, it became virtual. And it actually offered so much more because then people from all over the country could join. And so every week there's a theme, you know, so I end up doing a lot of research based on the theme. So I end up listening to a lot of music that I don't necessarily listen to. And, uh, you know, for instance, one theme last year was about country music. And I had no idea that that Mike D from the Beastie Boys actually did a country Western album. You know, it's a really, really wonderful thing that I look forward to every week. I wanted to ask you about that, about your works involving music and, and, and returning to actually to a subject you were just discussing in relation to literature and this idea of the, the, the Palestinian Israeli conflict mm. and the fact that you address this in this wonderful work, which actually was also looking at Leonard Cohen, your fandom of his work. So it was a work called I'm Good at Love, I'm Good at Hate, It's In Between I Freeze, which is a, a line from from a Cohen song. But you, you used a typewriter of his that you had got from eBay, right, to write him a letter mm -hmm. about your own conflict, but also his conflict in terms of the Palestinian question. Yes, and it had a lot to do w with a kind of continuation of these projects that are wondering about the fate of an artwork in a moment of um, of of war and a moment of conflagration, and so it was really centered on the fact that he was supposed to play this gig. I was visiting Ramallah for the first time in two thousand nine, and when I was there. People were really excited because Leonard Cohen had announced a concert or there had been a concert announced in the Ramallah Cultural Palace. And Leonard's work was something I came to through my wife, Lori, who is from Montreal. So you kind of have to learn how to ski when you marry somebody from Montreal and, and then Leonard Cohen kind of becomes your chief rabbi. And, you know, we went to see Leonard actually that, that year in concert. And it was quite frankly, the best concert experience I'd ever, I'd ever had. I mean, I've seen Springsteen, I've seen McCartney in rehearsal and everything. And, and this for me was like Elvis meets Yom Kippur services. In the letter, you say it's the most Jewish experience you've ever had. Yeah, because he also like he ends his concert with basically the Birchat Kohanim, which is a prayer that I adore. And, and the Kohanim, the Kohen tribe is supposed to bestow it as a priestly blessing on you. And he said it in layman's terms, you know, after going through this highly emotional concert, he says, um, you know, button up because the weather's tricky out there. If you fall, may it be on the side of luck. And may you be surrounded by your loved ones and friends. And if this is not your lot, may the blessings find you in your solitude. And, and I was just like, okay, this person is my new hero, you know, and, um, and the trigger for the work really came from that night, you know, because like when I get excited about something, I end up doing all of this deep research. And so I started going to every Leonard Cohen website that night. I was up until two or three in the morning and my wife, you know, who at that point was, you know, a few months pregnant, you know, was sleeping. And I come upon this Leonard Cohen forum where one of the the topics just simply said October 22nd, 1973, which was the exact date I was born. And um, and there's Leonard actually in the Sinai Desert, you know, playing for the Israeli troops. But next to him, while he's singing, is Ariel Sharon, a war criminal in the truest sense. And I thought to myself, what is going on here? And so it became this really interesting moment. You mentioned that museums are not neutral, but like we as artists are also not and so I started to, you know, wonder what he was doing there. And like most Jews in 1973, he, he, he thought that the Yom Kippur War uh, signaled um, an existential threat 
And in his diaries, he talked about how, you know, before that he was firmly on the side of the Palestinians, but then he needed to go to Israel to, quote, stop Egypt's bullet, knowing that the military uh, operation was being led by, by Egypt. And so I started to kind of look at that whole history, which he writes in his manuscript called My Final Revision of My Life in Art. And he talks about everything that he's feeling on the battlefield, all of the conflict that he feels in him, of the discomfort that he feels when he's looking at these body bags across the Suez. And the person who's the commander of that part of the base says, um, you know, don't, don't cry. They're, they're only Egyptians. And, and Leonard feels this discomfort and his sense of relief. You know, for me, this is an articulation of the ethical crisis of the post-Holocaust Jew. And so it became a really interesting point to make work from. The other thing that, that really kind of inspired this piece was that that concert in Ramallah had been planned by Leonard's management because he had already planned a concert in Tel Aviv. And so to mitigate criticism that he was playing Israel, they more or less made this gig in Palestine. And so at that point, the Palestinian academic and cultural boycott of Israel found out about it and explained, you know, rightfully that these attempts at parity are part of the problem, that you cannot equate the oppressor with the oppressed. You know, you started your question by saying something about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It's not a conflict. A conflict supposes symmetry. You know, Israel is this world-class army with technology, and we're talking about Gaza, which is an open-air prison. Some have equated it to a concentration camp. So this is Israeli settler colonialism and its violence as being visited on the people. And so what, what became very important to me in this work was to look at Leonard's dilemma and to realize that this, okay, so this concert ends up getting canceled in Palestine. He goes through with the Tel Aviv concert, but I thought to myself, he has this huge following in Palestine. He has a huge following in Syria, in Lebanon. You know, his writing, his poetry is incredibly important in these places. And he populated his songs with you know, instruments like the Arkelaut, which sounds like the Oud. He had an Oud player with him uh, during his late 1970s tour. And so it just seemed to me that there was something interesting about finding a way for the artwork to survive. And so Leonard's songs are not terribly hard to sing. I used to have a band in high school and I thought, well, maybe I could perform Leonard's songs and the vessel through which they would come. You know, this body with these Arab Jewish anti-Zionist lungs, you know, could I be permitted to sing his songs? And so it became a question. So yeah, getting the typewriter was, was really, I mean, it's like owning John Lennon's guitar, you know, like being able to kind of write him that letter where I indicate my position, but also I indicate a certain amount of understanding of his dilemma, you know, as somebody who's born in the mid 1930s and is 10 when you learn the horrible truth of the Holocaust and how that in, how that frames everything, you know, but that I wanted to kind of like he's coming from the West and making a decision and I'm coming from the East and making another you know, and can we blend somehow and allow for the music to survive, you know? And so it, it, it for me, asked a lot of questions that I'm really interested in. Unfortunately, it's a work that I can't show anymore because of the fact that, um, you know, it was shown in Montreal at the Musée d'Art Contemporain uh, in an exhibition that Leonard had given his tacit approval to when he was still alive, but the exhibition happened after he passed away. And so his management uh, was not okay with the side of the story that I was telling. 
and really wanted to have editorial say in how the film and, and the concert would happen, which to me was unacceptable um, because I know the kind of side of the story they were trying to tell and, and I, couldn't, I, I couldn't move forward with it. So it's basically a silenced film at this point. If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? One of the works that really changed my life was Emily Jasser's Where We Come From, which is this series of photos that document this question that she asked of the Palestinian population around the world, that if I could do one thing for you in Palestine, what would it be? And the things that they ask her to do, you know, go, go kiss my mother, go sign the memorial book, uh, for Faisal al Husseini, go to Jaffa and to and play with the first young person you see, go to East Jerusalem and and go on a date with this woman that I've been chatting to online, uh, but I can't get there because I can't get the visa, you know, to go from the West Bank uh, area A you know, to, to, uh, Jerusalem, you know, th those, those works for me in their humbleness, but also just how big they are, you know, really kind of bring to, to the fore, you know, what art can do, you know, in the way that surrogacy in art, you know, can happen. And it's an interesting thing because, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, like when I talk about the a project in in Margate, you know, I talk about my works as surrogates and substitutes. Uh, and the word substitute actually comes from the Latin substituere, which comes from statuere. And the noun derivative of statuere is statua or statue. You know, so this seems relevant to me as somebody who's a sculptor and thinking about what art can be. You know, so art being able to be that that place that we haven't gotten to yet, you know, activated through the magic of a kind of impact that's visited on form, you know, really inspires me. So I would want to live with something like that. I learn from that work all the time. In a way, you've just answered my final question, which is what is art for? Well, there you go. You know, and, you know, and it comes from, you know, this very close and deliberate attention that I've been paying to a lot of those things that were stolen from the museum that one of the more popular items that that went missing were votive sculptures you know those sculptures of the people with their hands clasped up against their chest looking like they're in prayer well in fact they are and the idea was that the worshiper would go to the akitu or the temple and they would bring that statue with them and it would be a stand-in for them. So they would go and pray at the, at the temple. But the idea was that you would leave that in your place. So it was always praying for you and you would always be receiving the blessings. That's a great way to end the conversation, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you, I really appreciate it. April is the Cruelest Month is a permanent commission in the town of Margate and it's part of England's Creative Coast, a series of commissions on the southeast coastline of the UK and you can find out more at englandscreativecoast.com. Michael's exhibition Nimrud continues at the Wellin Museum of Art at Hamilton College in Clinton, New York until the 18th of June. Michael also features in Les Flammes, L'Age de la Ceramique, which is at the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris in Paris from the 15th of October to the 6th of February next year. And if you want to hear the in-depth interview I did with Michael about The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, his work for the fourth plinth, you can find that in the archive of our sister podcast, The Week in Art. It was published on the 23rd of March 2018.
And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And do also subscribe to The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every Friday. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producers of the art newspaper podcasts are Judy Mahalska and Amy Dawson. Thanks to Henrietta Bentel, Danielle Hathaway and Kabir Jalla. Huge thanks to Michael Rakowitz. Join us on Friday for the Week in Art and we'll be back next Wednesday for the next episode of A Brush With. Bye for now. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.